In the heart of the state of the art, at the dawn of the next stage in entertainment, you found no proscenium. You have indeed found No Proscenium, the voice of everything immersive. I'm Noah Nelson, and welcome to episode 403. This week, Nick Fortuno, the director of Gaming Pathways at City College of New York, slips into the host chair to interview an artist he's collaborated with for years now, filmmaker and director of Columbia University's Digital Storytelling Lab, Lance Weiler, whose critically acclaimed immersive storytelling experience, Where There's Smoke, is currently running at Art Yard in Frenchtown, New Jersey through October 1st, with an upcoming artist talk on September 30th. Nick and Lance have been working together for a long time now, and we thought it would be a unique opportunity to play with the NoPro format and have artistic collaborators take a deep dive into a piece of work. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Now, be forewarned. This conversation dives into a bit about elder care and the death of a parent. It doesn't do it for a long time, but pretty much everything is predicated on that. If you are currently dealing with with these issues or have dealt with it, you might find some things familiar, but I think you'll find yourself feeling more seen than anything in that case. If you haven't, well, those parts of the conversation are good to hear before you wrestle with such things. Take that on faith if you must. Before we go into the interview, it's been a busy week on the site with a glowing review of Albany Park Theater Project and Third Rail Project's Port of Entry in Chicago, the latest edition of The Call Sheet, which launched with nine listings, and a review rundown filled with six hefty reviews. Check the show notes for links, and there's even more on deck for next week. We'd also like to thank Sea Tickets, sponsor of this year's Next Stage Immersive Summit, Making an Impact Pillar who, thanks to that sponsorship, are bringing you all of NoPro for the next two weeks. Sea Tickets has proudly supported thousands of clients across the globe in areas as diverse as historic attractions like Stonehenge, immersive theater like The Burnt City, and important cultural touchstones like L.A. Pride. Thanks again to Sea Tickets for helping us with the big swing of the next stage this year. Of course, none of this is possible, Not not a single bit of it without our Patreon backers. Truly, you set us on this path. And this week, one of our backers upped their pledge to the sustaining level. So thanks, Cameo Wood, for jumping up to the sustaining backer level. Always humbled when someone does that, even if it's just for a hot minute. Now, right now, we're on a campaign to get our backers, like like at any level, up to 450. We want to grow the backer number. We need six new backers to hit the next milestone on that path, which is 425. And then we only have 25 left to go. If you rely on what we do, please hit up patreon.com slash no proscenium. It not only powers the podcast and websites for no pro and everything immersive, it also gets you into our member only discord, we just had one of our coffee clutches uh, Thursday. I uh, had had some folks show up. Had just a, a nice little sprawling conversation there, and programming some more of those soon enough. You'll also find a whole community of creators and fans on there. Uh, Catherine uh, is a member of that community and isn't actively working, but you know you'll find her grabbing news items and putting them into the forum. Uh, you'll find other folks jumping in. Uh, the Philly scene is popping right now, thanks to Tom Wilson. Uh, and yeah, there's just all sorts of stuff going on in there all the time. I can't keep up. <laughs> I literally can't keep up. Uh, you uh, backers... Uh, it's, it's exclusive to you, uh, along with those folks who were in there before we made it exclusive. Uh, and you just link your Patreon account to get access. So if you're looking to get access, this is the way to do it. Uh, if you're already a backer, help us spread the word. So many of you do. It always, it always is such a joy when I see someone spreading the word. Um, but still more, more could do it. Uh, drop a review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Share the articles you find useful on your social media platform of choice. It helps immensely. Uh, I'm hanging out on blue sky a lot these days because I find it the most tolerable option. Uh, 
even though there are times it drives me nuts and I wish it was open. Uh, Threads is just a little dead. Like, anyway, maybe we'll talk more on the back end. Um, we are always no proscenium except on Insta and on Threads, another reason why it bugs me, where we are no underscore proscenium. But if you search, you'll find us. All right. Big thanks to our sustaining backers. Samuel Mustry, Chris Woolman, Samantha Davison, Eric Shamlin, Elaine, Daryl, John Boulette, Cameo Wood, Jay Bushman, Jerome Joseph Gentes, Tom Leonetti McGuire, Kurt Collins, Wynn Thorne, Ryan, David Bassick, Richard Ayers, Lonnie Hands on, Lecker Lacool, The Ministry of Peculiarities, and Jan Budman. And hey, if you want to work out a deal uh, for our community, you want to do something special for us, that's another great way to support the show. Hit me up at noah at noprosidium.com and we can discuss details. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Nick Fortuno sitting in the host chair this week. I am a game designer and interactive narrative designer, and I am the director of Gaming Pathways, which is a, a game development and art and technology program at City College of New York. And I'm here uh, in this podcast because uh, we are going to be talking uh, with a creator and uh, filmmaker and uh, teacher that I have worked with for a very long time, Lance Weiler, about his most recent project, which is ongoing right now at Art Yard in Pennsylvania called Where There's Smoke. And so I want to introduce everyone to Lance Weiler. Oh, thanks, Nick. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, excited for our conversation tonight. Big fan of NoPro. Um, and uh, you know, thanks for taking the time to, to talk with me. Great. So could you, could we just start by talking a little bit uh, about your background? I mean, this is a good place to say that, you know, you and I have been collaborating for over 10 years at this point on a number of projects, but why don't we give everybody a sense of like how you got started in, in this giant arena we call immersive and like what, what kinds of work you've been doing and where? Sure. Um, well, I've been kind of working at the edges, I guess, for quite some time. Uh, a lot of my work intersects with emergent technology. It has for well over 20 years. Um, you know, the first movie that I ever made, uh, the last broadcast became the first all digital release of a motion picture. I went on to kind of continue to experiment with fusing technology with my work uh, and also challenging the notion of those formerly known as the audience. And I was very drawn to this idea of immersion, this, this notion of being able to uh, expand the definition of what a story could be uh, and to enable people to kind of move through, have it spill off screens and into the real world and back. And so I've been doing that for quite some time. I've done a lot of large scale installations. Um, you know, uh, back in the day, I did one called Pandemic. Uh, 1.0, which had its premiere at Sundance. I went on to collaborate with David Cronenberg on a project called Body Mind Change, which was the first collaboration I believe that we did together, Nick, back in 2013, 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I, I think that was that was the first collaboration that got out into the world, right? Um, yeah. We were we were already poking at Sherlock at that point, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. And then then we would go on to to do a number of uh, kind of lab based collaborations. Um, I'm a professor of practice at Columbia University School of the Arts, where I'm jointly appointed in, in film and theater. And uh, I'm a founding member and director of the Digital Storytelling Lab, which I started there back in 2013. So it's almost 10 years that we've been at the lab. And so a number of our collaborations have come out of that. Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things, uh, which became a global kind of experience, you know, over 2,600 collaborators from 60 different countries, over 180 self-organized events around the world. And then that rolled into uh, Frankenstein AI, which we took to Sundance and then did a really interesting uh, kind of commission with the National Theater and, uh, and uh, ITFA, Doc Lab. And uh, brings us to where there's smoke, where you've been involved and, and been a collaborator on that since I started prototyping it back in 2016. Uh, so, you know, our, our relationship has been one of experimentation. 
you know, I think what I what I love about the opportunity to collaborate with you, Nick, is that you come from a very different discipline than I do. Yet there's intersection from your understanding of narrative design and and, and play that works really well in terms of in terms of the work and, and what I'm interested in. But really for me, because I'm always asked, because I came out of a filmmaking tradition, I'm often asked, you know, like, well, why don't you just make a film? You know, but there's something about being able to explore and, uh, and to try things and to experiment uh, that I'm constantly drawn to. And I, I just love, I love uh, maybe some of the creative chaos that comes out of that. The unexpectedness, uh, the the element of when something starts to interact with an audience and they become collaborators in it too. I, I think I I really love um, those aspects uh, of the work that we've done together and and also the the other work I do in my practice. Well, I think I think creative chaos uh, and and uh, and and opening things up to the audience takes us really nicely into the into the current incarnation of where there's smoke actually. Uh, so can can you we give everybody a sense of um, of that project? Like what what is that project and what you know is in a short way what what how is it currently taking shape? Right? What is, what is its current form? I want to talk about how it's iterated over the last few years, but I want to start by giving people a picture of like what they might see if they went to Art Yard right now and 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 just the top line of what the piece is. Sure. Um, well, I think if, if I come into it, I'll come in with the story first because I'm, I'm a storyteller by trade. And so this is by far the most vulnerable and personal project I've ever attempted to make. And it's funny because when I go back and I think about the initial where when I wanted to start doing it, it's probably like 17 years I've been kicking it around. Right. You know, just thinking about doing it, wanting to do it. Uh, but because it was so kind of emotionally charged, uh, you know, I was hesitant. Uh, for a period of time. And then there were some external forces that just, you know, accelerated the whole timeline of everything. Uh, so basically, I grew up in a firefighting culture. My dad was an amateur fire scene photographer and a volunteer firefighter for 20 years. And I grew up in that culture. You know, I grew up uh, with like fire scanners in the house and you know, we would go to fire parades, and beef and beers, pancake breakfast, you know, like I, I lived and breathed that culture. And uh, along the way, you know, my dad would photograph all these blazes. And I learned photography uh, from him. That's where, you know, I, I think I had my first uh, single lens reflex camera when I was in third grade, I had bought it at a yard sale. And I started learning about photography and my dad had a dark room and I started processing film. And um, and then I would kind of ride along with him when he would when the fire scanner would go off and we race off and, you know, he um, I would be loading film into the cameras, changing lenses and kind of almost like assisting him, you know, and then we would be behind the scenes and, you know, close to these crazy blazes. And it was it was really wild, you know. And so uh, later on. We had two devastating fires in my youth, one where our van erupted in flames on a family vacation while we were in it. Uh, we all got out safely. And then the other was 11 months later, our house burned to the ground. And for whatever reason, you know, I always wondered if my dad had anything to do with those blazes. Right. And so there was this part where it was like and I don't know if it was because, you know, my, my dad was we had a great, great relationship. You know, he was of a different generation. So wasn't necessarily as expressive in terms of what he was actually really going through or what he was feeling. Uh, but, um, turn me on to like film noir, turn me on to like all kinds of B movies, turn me on to a whole bunch of crazy experimental classical, uh, and ambient sounds, you know, he, he was really, uh, very, um, you know, was very, um, he, he was an enigma. I guess. Right. And so I don't know if it's kind of seeded all in throughout all that of my upbringing, but, you know, he worked on the night shift. I was never really sure what he did, you know, like it was this whole mystery around my dad. Right. And so, uh, flash forward a number of years and he, he ends up, um, uh, you know, he, um, he finds out that he has uh, stage four colon cancer and, uh, I'm with him and, you know, my mom won't go into the, uh, won't go for the, you know, the, the prognosis. And so my wife and I go with him and 
we experience this total lack of empathy within care at that moment when he's finding out how much more time he has to live. And um, I'm struck by it. And when I, when, I, when I leave that experience, I just feel like, oh, there has to be something more to this. There has to be some other way to maybe storytelling can aid the process of you know, care. Maybe there's a better way. And, and with my parents, they really did not talk about end of life at all. They weren't prepared for end of life. And so the piece kind of starts in this really wild kind of mystery space but then it's ultimately like kind of a mystery of like, who is my father? You know, then it's kind of like this universal mystery of like, how do you navigate healthcare? And then ultimately kind of this mystery about life and death. And so the first time that I started playing with it was in 2016. So kind of as my dad's body is failing, my courage to ask anything is growing. And he actually invites me to come and interview him. And to ask him anything that I want. And so I start recording just these audio recordings with him over the course of like a year. And um, and he allows me to ask him anything. And all these skeletons start to emerge from the closet. You know, all these things that I never knew. And like some of them are like earth shattering, crazy. Uh, and this is all at the point while he's, he's fading away. But he's totally... Um, you know, super open and, and and willing to answer anything. But I think he suggested that format because he wouldn't talk like that just in normal conversation. It was like it almost had to have the frame that I was interviewing him to allow him to be able to express himself openly. And so that led to uh, uh, a collaboration between us, right? Like, and and I would talk to him about what I was thinking about doing because this could have been a a series or a, a film, but I wanted to do something different with it. I wanted to, to, to touch into the immersive qualities of what it was. And so that set me down a path um, of just experimentation because we cared for my dad, I'd say probably about seven or eight years. It was a long process. You know, it was a lot of cycles of chemo, a lot of back and forth and to the hospital in and out of the hospital. And, you know, we were principal kind of caregivers for my dad. So, you know, I learned a lot about that whole process. I learned a lot about how to navigate care. And uh, in going through that, I started to collaborate with the narrative medicine program at Columbia University. And it was an amazing program. It was it was all about finding, you know, finding ways to use storytelling as a, as a way to bridge care to help communication between health practitioners and patients. And I started experimenting with them and the lab started experimenting with them. And some of their methods started to bleed into what I was doing and, uh, you know, just started to continue to experiment. But it kind of came from this very deep and personal place. Um, and and I think also, if, if I'm honest about it, I was just trying to navigate my own grief. I was trying to process it. You know, I couldn't really talk about it with my family. There was no preparation for it. So I think the project was a way for me to try to make sense of all of it, you know, at a time where it was like, it was just, you know, I found myself like clouded by it and it was like washing over me. And for anybody that's gone through it, you know, you know that it ebbs and flows and hits you in unexpected ways. And so I just thought, wow, there's something really interesting in this whole mix. Um, and that's kind of where that, that that's kind of the origin of it. Yeah, so it, it, um, if you know, having done other projects with the lab, it's a it's a good point to say that the, these projects tend to develop over um, a lot of iterations that are done actually publicly. Uh, we have we have a long standing relationship with Lincoln Center where we run meetups, and there are classes being taught at Columbia where these projects get prototyped and prototyped and prototyped. So, so when we're when when Lance is talking about like a period of seven years and so essentially where this piece is being worked on, it goes through iterations during that time, meaning like versions of it are built and experimented with and changed over that period. So can you talk a little bit about that 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 first iteration that came out of 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 that that experience as you started to move it into the lab and as you started to talk to narrative medicine? Um, and this is this just to give a reference point to everybody is eventually the piece that that appeared at Tribeca um, that that ran as part of the the uh, a series with wall play. Yeah, there was um, there was some initial prototyping that happened at Lincoln Center back in, I'd say, 2016, 2017. 
and they were really crazy experiments. Like I remember one, I like I'm I'm way into this idea of like I love the Internet of Things, right? Like I'm I, I love this idea of enchanted objects, and so. <laughs> So in the earliest ones, I did this crazy kind of almost like weird performance thing. Like I'm a huge uh, Fluxus, like I, I love, like Fluxus, the art movement was a, a big influence in what I do. Happenings is a big influence in what I, what I do. And, and so I was staging these live kind of performances. And I, I remember the very, the very first one had like kind of a bed of almost like pins and it had this helium balloon, this black balloon that was just like floating above. And I had like a table out and I was doing this weird thing with like secrets and lies that people were doing where they would, they would come up and they whisper to somebody. And then there was like this tweeting that was happening. And then the tweeting was like, dependent upon if it was a secret or a lie, it was lowering the balloon up and down. And then the audience was involved and the balloon was going up and down, up and down. It was creating this dramatic tension as it was kind of being lowered, 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 closer until it was going to like pop. And then I was telling these stories and I was showing these images and it was really just a total crazy experiment. Right. Um, And uh, you know, it was a prototype. So there were parts of it that were just like horrible that broke that, that didn't make sense. But then there were other parts that were that, that really resonated. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I, I want to go further. I want to lean into that more. That was unexpected. And, and a prototyping process is really quite wonderful, as you know, because it, it opens up all these unexpected surprises. You know, like if you're open to the process of it, you know, a, a lot of the work and the way that I approach it, the way that we approach it together and the way that we approach it at the lab is it starts with the human experience. So you really try to understand the human experience before you commit to any, you know, extensive coding or, or building, because often these are bespoke projects, right? You know, you're, you're going to be coding, or you're going to be creating something. And usually you have to, you end up having to roll it, you know, pull it all together yourself, you know? So, so at that time, it was very much like, crazy eclectic that then led to subsequent iterations where it started to you know get into a mechanic of like physical objects you know like where all of a sudden i would have paper prototype of there was like a a ta- uh, there was a cassette there was a 35 millimeter camera there was a walkie talkie and there was a 35 millimeter camera um uh, a cassette tape too so there were four objects and you would kind of mix and match them based upon there was like a symbol of a hand and there was like a, a brain and there was like an eye and the, and the, and and the, they would they would bring meaning to it. I didn't define what it was. They just would a, a group of four people, six people would stand around and they'd say like, oh, what do we think goes here? Oh, the camera must mean something about memory. So it connects to the brain. Let's put it there. Oh, the cassette must mean something about the heart. It, you know, it's, you know, and the, the, the phone must mean it had a rotary phone. It must mean the hand. And so they would mix and match. And when they do that, it would unlock a narrative, a story, a fragment, right? And you'd see slides. I'd be doing a slideshow and you'd hear audio stories. And, and it was very like mechanical. Yeah, and just to be prototypes. just to be to paint this picture clearly, like the, the the way these prototypes actually worked is we would we would show up in a in a small uh, a theater space, like kind of movie theater space in Lincoln Center, and there'd be a table at the front, and then Lance and I or some other people would just give give a quick talk, and and you'd have like thirty to eighty to one hundred people in that room, right, depending on on the on the population. And we and we just have the that test. That was it, right? It's like, oh, we have a table and these objects, and Lance has some slides and que- some audio cues uh, set up. And then we just invite people on stage with basically no instruction, and we say like, okay, j- just do do this minimal little thing, and let's see what we do. And the idea in these tests was to see like some really basic things, right? Like just like what what do people associate with symbols? Are symbols the right way to do this? It's moving objects interesting, and like and imagine that. The, these tests during this eclectic period are actually can be that small. And it's just looking at that one object. Is that, it, it, does that fair Lance? Like that's kind of like where we were at at that stage. Yeah. Well, I think like with the tests and, you know, this is something that we do in both our, our, our practices, we really kind of design for an aesthetic. Right. And so 
I knew that I wanted this piece to be kind of the aesthetic is about being clouded by grief. And when you're clouded by grief, the only way that you can really navigate it is with other people. And I knew that that was a core and, and I wanted it to have some degree of emotional resonance to it. But later, when I would reflect back on those early prototypes, which then would lead to what we would do at the future of storytelling as, a, as an early prototype of it, and then eventually at uh, Tribeca in 2019 during Storyscapes, was um, this idea where, you know, you kind of make your way into the space, you'd sit down in a white room across from a stranger, you go through a visualization exercise that had you, uh, you know, saving something from a place that you had lived currently or lived in the past. And then you would end up like kind of opening your eyes when you had it in your hands and you would draw it on a card and you would end up interviewing the person across from you, like the stranger. You would ask each other one question five times in a row. Uh, and then that would lead to uh, this really dynamic kind of priming activity that made somebody think about their own lives before they moved into it. And then it would go into this weird kind of escape room moment where there was like a box that opened and it had all these artifacts from my dad in it. And you would be given like 90 seconds to go through it. But once the box opened, there was a sensor in it and it would set everything in motion in the other room. It would cue the sound score. It would cue the lighting. It would do everything that it needed to. And then a door would kind of creak open after you finished looking at the box and you walk in with these flashlights and a map. It kind of had like a little bit of an escape room kind of vibe going on at that point. And you would walk down this hallway that was all burned out and you get down to the end and there was a hole in the wall and you'd step through this hole in the wall into this kind of like den or rec room set that had been just destroyed by fire. And I actually had saved and brought artifacts that had originally gone through the fire in my house and they were in there in the set pieces. And then there was a table in the center of the room that uh, was a light table. You can imagine like with like light panels in it, right? Like it's a wood table with these sunken kind of light panels. And then as you use the map, you would realize like, oh, th this object looks like it's related and you pick it up. And when you picked up one of the, the objects, the table would come to life, the 35 millimeter slide projector on the table would come to life and would start projecting stuff on screen. And then you would realize that you needed to find four things and you would start to mix and match those things. And as you mixed and matched them, it would unlock uh, fragments. Now it's important to note that it was a generative piece. It's very interesting, like this piece, and I've talked about this previously, but it's one of those things where it's defined by the things that it is not. You know, I, I say, well, it's like a documentary, but it's not linear. It's non-linear right it's like an immersive theater piece but there's no actors it's like an escape room but there's no escape right like so it's almost like i have to define these things in order to, to say what it is and to get to what it is um but if i think back on that now that i've had time to reflect on it i think in the point all of that was happening really up in to my dad's death and i think the design of that was very logical very mechanical and i found myself kind of I guess in some ways kind of keeping myself away from it almost away from the pure feelings of what it was or, or, or designing something that was a little bit more logical, right? Cause I was trying to find some logic in this crazy right. chaotic world that I found myself in only later would I realize that, that, and, and then I would start to think about iterating it in different ways and challenge myself to let go more in terms of what I was doing, uh, which then led into the subsequent, like iterations of it. Yeah. Cause it, I mean, it, I mean, it's interesting that you describe it as, as logical. Cause like the process, the process in the main room was, was quite frankly, a logical process. You had these four objects around the room and these four spots on the table and you would pick up an object and then kind of figure out that you were supposed to put it on the table. And then when, when four objects were on the table, it would trigger a slide and an audio piece that was based on the combination of things you had put down but then you could rearrange them to try to find more of them, more of those clips and audio pieces. So it was almost like a sequencing kind of puzzle, like quite literally, like a sequencing puzzle of these objects. And that, you know, I can get the sense, you know, I, I get the sense from you. Yeah, reflecting back on it it, it, it has a kind of like, like very, very analytic approach to to finding these these stories. Um, so that ran and and that that ran at it was a test of it at Future of Storytelling that ran for a few days and then it ran at Tribeca for I, I can't remember how long it was like a like a like a like a weekish or something like that how long was it running for at Tribeca 
Well, it ran for about two weeks. We extended and we did a collaboration with Wallplay at the time, which was a really interesting model. Wallplay was an organization that I believe they came out of the new media, I'm sorry, the new museums accelerator. And they had a model where they would look for real estate that was vacant, you know, retail space that was vacant that nobody was using. And they would go in and they would structure deals that would allow artists to come in and make use of that space. So they had like, I don't know, maybe uh, at the time, 10 different storefronts up and down Canal Street. So I had talked to them and said, oh, hey, this would be really interesting to do the first offsite that ever took place at Tribeca. What would it be like if we broke this thing out and, and, and had it in a storefront so folks from the festival could come, but anybody walking by could be a part of it too. And the, the one at the Future of Storytelling starts as a single room. The one at um, uh, during Tribeca is like 1,400 square feet. So it has like multiple rooms, which then like subsequently, you know, it, it, it's commissioned to travel and then COVID hits. And then I, I kind of, I'm sitting around and I'm kind of thinking about it. And, and then I decide to um, create another iteration of it, you know, and that particular iteration becomes a totally embraces web pervasive tools. And I'm like, hmm, what can I take from what I've learned so far and how can I challenge what this is? And I did an iteration that kind of involved uh, Zoom and Miro. So I, I, I uh, kind of uh, subverted productivity tools and turned them into collaborative storytelling and sense making tools. Right. So because uh, Miro is a Miro is essentially like a collaborative whiteboarding tool, right? Where people yeah. can like put different images and post it notes up, and and you have kind of an infinite canvas, so you can like write things and and pull images from other places and drop them in, and it becomes kind of like a giant poster board. Of, of objects. And we got really into that in the DSL for a while with a number of pieces. Yeah, because it's unique because it's an infinite canvas that can have upwards of 250 concurrent users on it at the same time. And I, I, I started thinking like, well, what if I took these collage elements that I'm making? And what if I, I, I create these like story based kind of collages that involve art? Because I'm a I'm an emerging media artist. So I do a lot of um, you know, I've taken a, a bunch of my dad's photographs and I do a lot of glitch based art and I've made new pieces out of them. And I took some of the journal that I was writing during the time that all this was happening. And I kind of created these um, uh, rich media based collages with audio, video, text layering. And I thought, oh, it'd be really cool if I just gave editorial permission to anybody that came into the board. Right. So they can move the layers away and uncover and excavate. And then I thought, well, what if they did that while they were in a Zoom breakout? So now I have this infinite Miro canvas in front of me, but the only way I can navigate around it is I'm talking to the other people who happen to be in the breakout room. And they're like, where are you? I'm over here. Oh, I don't see that. How do I get there? And sometimes they would actually help each other and you'd see them like maneuver together to move through the board. But I became fascinated with this idea that I'm going to put so much into this. There's no way that you can see everything and complete everything in the time you have. It became very much a metaphor for when somebody is dying, where do you choose to put your presence? How present are you? What do you get caught up in? And, and, and I wanted it to feel like you had to pick and choose what you were doing, right? Like, not that there was a clock ticking necessarily, but like you would feel when you got to the end of it, like, oh, wow, I missed that. Because then later when people would talk, they would be like, oh, I saw this over here. Or I was here. Or, or even when you're in it, when people are like talking about different things that they've seen, you can't get to them. You're not sure how to get to them, you know, and there was something really powerful about that. And so I, I thought, okay, I prototyped that a couple different times. And then I thought during the, during the pandemic, I thought, oh, there's a lot of loss. Maybe people would be interested in coming to this. And I, I started just running it at one o'clock on Sundays and I ended up running it for months and months and months because people just kept showing up for it. And um, I would have anywhere at the high end, maybe about 80 people going through in about 90 minutes. And we ran it as these shows, right, that people could interact with. Um, and a ton of really interesting things surfaced from that in terms of learnings. Um, and I started to let go more, where the first version and future of storytelling and Tribeca was very, it was docent, you know, four people going through at a time, you know, it was very much on rails. You do this and then you can do this and then you can do this. It was very gated. Now, all of a sudden with the, the virtual version of where there's smoke, it's like literally like chaos. It's like people anywhere that they want to be in that 
canvas moving all over, helping each other to navigate it and uh, kind of uncovering all kinds of things. Um, and then we would do talkbacks and I would collaborate with Dr. Deborah Starr, who um, is a lecturer in the narrative medicine program. And we would have conversations and, um, and they were incredibly powerful in terms of what people felt because the piece was always what I hoped would happen with it, which has started to happen with it is that it, my dad and I's story is kind of a springboard for people to kind of reflect on their own life, their own loss, their own memory. Cause in the Miro board, there started to be more little participatory beats, places where you could leave reflections, things where you could leave something about yourself or collage for somebody that you had lost or say something about something that you wanted to do before you died. You know, it had these moments of light, you know, kind of participation where you could leave a piece of yourself. Um, and I, I, and I thought that that was really interesting in that that started to lead more and more towards, you know, what eventually would start to move into this, the iteration that we're in now. Yeah, I, I can, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, it, it was, it was such a, uh, a, a, a real treasure for me to be able to collaborate on this piece, even from the earliest days, because, um, I would encounter people after they went through it, even at Future of Storytelling, who would then have these conversations about grief with me. And those were not conversations I had had at that time with with almost anyone. Um, and and I learned a lot about um, about being an ally for people in that context, just from like literally seeing people as they were exiting and and figuring out ways of of talking to them. Um, and how and how moved you know there was there, even from the earliest parts there were there were always p people in the audience who would come out be feeling seen in their grief and having a chance to have that conversation. And that was, I remember sitting at the after events at future of storytelling, talking with people at this party, essentially that was being held of, you know, after this, this big event with people about the, the loss of their parents or their other relatives, because they finally had had a chance to talk about it in a way that they, they really felt they couldn't before. Um, so I, I think that was that was very present. And so then you were experiencing that with groups of people like every Sunday for a pretty long period of time. Um, and then I, I guess at some point this this sort of intersects with Art Yard, right? Like that's that's is, is was that the initiation of the next phase was like 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 getting in contact with Art Yard. And I, we should explain to everybody what Art, Art Yard is. Sure. I mean, I think that um, one thing, if I could backtrack for a moment, that yeah. I think I started to realize from the virtual experiences in particular, um, which was apparent even in the early prototypes, because at Tribeca, we, we, we created a space that was like kind of um, an area where people could decompress before they left, uh, was the, the importance of holding space for these types of conversations. Cause I remember when my dad was dying, people would be very nice. You know, they would be like, they, they cared. They would ask how he was doing. And it usually would go a couple ways. Oh, how, how's your dad doing? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope everything's okay. You know, and it was the same thing over and over and over again. And, and, and people just didn't know how to express, you know, and especially when you're caring for somebody who's dying, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot, it gets really hardcore at times, right? Like you, it becomes incredibly uh, intimate in ways that are unexpected. It, it becomes uh, mentally challenging in different regards. That's why there's amazing things with like hospice when you're able to engage with hospice care. Uh, in the case of my parents, uh, they fought hospice until the very, very end. So we were the hospice for my dad up until the end, right? Like, so, so you're dealing with like a lot uh, of, of stuff flying at you, not to mention trying to navigate their care to make sure that they're comfortable, right? Like that, that's like a, that's, that's important. So you find yourself having these conversations that feel, I mean, people mean well, but they feel very superficial, you know, and there's very rarely do they, do they go to any any depth, you know, and so I thought, well, maybe maybe there's a way to hold space for that or have conversations around it where you start to realize to the point that you made, like, oh, I was having conversations I've never had before, and I started to understand maybe what that process is like because we all share it. We're we're all going to experience loss, you know, um, and ultimately we're all going to die, you know. So, but not to be so uh, like this, uh, I'm not trying to be so <laughs> dire in this, but. But but I think it raises a point that I think is important. So when I when I reached out to Art Yard, kind of building upon what you were asking, why Art Yard? Art Yard is a uh, an amazing 
performing arts center residency that's in Frenchtown, New Jersey. It's about an hour and 15 minutes from New York. It has um, two beautiful galleries that are about 3,000 square feet as a theater that is about 100 plus, uh, 170 plus uh, seats pitched for dance. So you can see it's, it's really beautiful. And then they have these residency buildings, right? And they have a workshop and they have another black box, another gallery, all kinds of things. And it's in this small river town started by, um, you know, folks who, who wanted to bring, celebrate the cultural, you know, the arts culture that had been in that region for a long time and wanted to kind of help incubate new work that was transformative in some way, participatory in some way that involved community. And so when I saw their mission, and I had been going up there uh, prior to the, to the new building that they had opened, and I always thought, wow, you know, I think I think where their smoke would be really great here because it's only a few miles from where my dad was a firefighter. It makes a lot of sense. It meets the mission. So eventually, I um, you know, I get in contact with them and have conversations, and and I go and I I present to them an idea of like, hey, I know that you do a lot, you you know, you you do a lot of programming, but you haven't necessarily really done a lot with emerging media. What if I came and incubated something here? We could incubate it together. I could incubate it with the community. They could be a part of the design process of what it was. And then through that, we could introduce maybe some new capacities to the organization that, that, that help you to understand how you might be able to embrace this tech kind of moving forward. And so um, they were excited about that. And, uh, and we designed something that would allow for us to drop in and have adequate uh, kind of prototyping time and development time. So uh, earlier this year, I think we got in there in February. And so we have February, March, April, May, June. So we had that time to kind of prototype it, test it, iterate upon it, figure out, you know, what made sense, you know, in terms of the logistics of the build out, the set design, everything for it, right? Like, so uh, obviously it goes without saying the more time that you can get in the space, the better, the better the experience will be, hopefully, um, and that you can get more of a handle on what you're actually designing and, and the reason why you're, you're doing it, right? Like, so yeah, yeah, I, and just for out of that. And for reference, I mean, like in some of the earlier pieces that we did, you know, together and through the DSL, like, you did, and, I, and I'm and i not knocking these these spaces like, you know, like, but but some of the stuff we did at Sundance, what was our 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 loaded install time on something like Frankenstein AI? Maybe like two days, maybe, maybe, you know, like realistically, maybe, maybe three, maybe if we were lucky four, you know, it was it was always really fast. And and with those things, you know, you're hoping you're kind of kind of hoping they're going to work. You know what I mean? You know, like you're, you're dropping in and you're trying to do your best to connect, connect the dots, but inevitably it's, um, you know, the, it's a challenge, right? Like, so with Art Yard to have that kind of time to test it. Um, and I remember one of the earliest things it was, it was great. I was talking with my colleagues who were involved in it, Peter English, who uh, is a composer and, you know, helped produce it. Um, and uh, Josh Korn, who's with Double Take Studios, who was the technical director and, and did a lot of the development around it. There was an early point where I was like, I want to get this in with the key stakeholders from the organization. I want to run it. I want to run a prototype of it for them. And uh, they were like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I'm sure. And so we get there and I remember, and I, I did this chant that comes from you, Nick, you know, which you always do in your classes, which is like, my first prototype is going to suck. And so I stand up there in front of the whole organization on the stage and I chant that I get them to chant it back to me. And then I run a version of it. Right. And they then and they go through it. And we worked out a very simple um, web presence that allowed us to just click on links for files of the fragments. And people were kind of wandering around this space on stage in a theater. It's kind of like a black box kind of vibe. And they're walking with their flashlights of their phone and they're excavating these tables where I've created all kinds of 11 by 17 art, have artifacts from my dad, from my life. And you're kind of excavating those tables as you move. And as you move, you're hearing stories, fragments, right? So the whole piece is like these fragments. And so I, I ran it and I had no idea. In the early incarnation, I was like, oh, I'll put symbols on this. So, oh, I see a van, that table's a van. I see a 
a mountain, that table's a mountain. And people were very completist at, be, at, the, at the start, right? And, and eventually we would end up randomizing the audio. We would end up making it that you didn't hear a story when you were at a table. It was a conditional that when you walked away from it, then you got a story, which then made you feel like you were, the stories weren't necessarily fully tied. And then I would like load balance story across all those tables, right? So you were bound to find out of the fragments, there was a little bit of every story at every table, right? But you were, you were kind of going through, you know, my parents would probably say collectors, I would say hoarders. Um, You were kind of like, it was the process when I was cleaning out their house, you know, like I would literally go through piles and piles of things. And then three weeks later, I find something in another pile that connected back. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting mechanic. And so in this early test, I've printed out stuff from the Miro board, right? These collages, these journal entries. I have like camera bags. I have uh, other like greeting cards, like all these really personal things. And people are kind of moving through it and they're using their phone flashlight to navigate. And I'm sitting back and I'm watching and I'm like, oh man, this is amazing. You know, like... It just I'm able to flow all of these people up. They're moving through, and and I end up having, uh, I guess at the the most I got to like 25 people on that stage, kind of moving around with their phones. And I was like, wow, this is like scaling, and and it was hitting emotional beats faster than what I had done, you know, at Tribeca. So Tribeca was 45 minutes. All of a sudden, this experience is like 35, right? And I'm getting more people through it, and. And then it finished and it was very kind of them, but they said that did not suck. And I said, okay, well, that's good. That's good. That it didn't suck. Uh, you know, and then we just would continually test it over and over and over again. And I would slightly tweak things and I'd say, okay, this time we're going to test for this. We would always have a question that we were trying to answer in some way. Um, and that, and, and through that prototyping process, I went from a very literal uh, staging of this, right? Like I had, I had renders, I went through, I went crazy. I rendered out the whole space. I was like, here's a hospital bed and here's this, what my den used to look like. And here are the scanners. And I was going to do the monochromatic. So they were kind of a canvas, but I found myself later just leaning more and more to that original black box that I found just by prototyping on stage. And I realized how powerful the papers on the tables were because I kept challenging myself, how can I do this without docents? How can I do it without a reset in the room? And the papers were beautiful because everybody would organize them in different ways. And when you would come to them, you would reorganize them and they just kept going and going. And now over six weeks, it's been the same way that people, like I go up there and I'll periodically drop in and I'll look at it in the room set you know, which is like crazy, you know, anybody that listens that has to reset a space will appreciate the fact of like, holy shit, we're not resetting the space. They're, they're doing it. You know, their actions are, are, are um, resetting it every time, you know, there's no true reset for it, which is interesting. Um, And so, um, but that came out of the prototyping, the tables came out of the prototyping, it moved from being very prescriptive in terms of what the set was to becoming more and more open. And the more that I let go of it in terms of where people could navigate, in terms of decoupling stories from the tables, in terms of letting them excavate things, it started to become more and more powerful. So the previous version where I was talking about being very logical, this one was at a different point in my processing the grief of my dad and then my mom passed away. You know, so I was in a different place. You know, so I, I I was more interested in that idea of what is it to let go? What is it to design a space that lets go? And our story is just central, but you're kind of able to go off and explore or excavate. But really, people started to go deeper and deeper into their own stories. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that, that that came out of a prototyping process, right? If I didn't prototype, I would have built that prescriptive set. No doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't think it would have been nearly as powerful. I think the fact that it, it, it ignites the imagination when you're there, because it also I took a lot of um, slides after my dad died. I found thousands of fire slides and they're incredible. He's like an outsider artist. They're amazing. And I blew them up to like, you know, uh, they're like five feet. They're They're huge and they hang on the walls. And I did some really elaborate kind of lighting that makes them all look like they're projected. So you're kind of amongst these fire slides. You're kind of moving through this, ex, you know, excavating these tables. 
But all of that was a direct, came out of the incubation time, right? You know, anybody that's done theater, it's so much in the workshopping of it. Anybody who's written scripts knows that it's all in the drafts that you do. You know, if you're fortunate enough to have rehearsals, you know, that's great. Um, but but uh, yeah, it was just really powerful. And I think this work doesn't work unless you can actually do that with people, right? That you can actually try it with people. Otherwise, you're just making all kinds of assumptions. Uh, I, and I, I want to, you know, we're getting close to the end here, but I want to I want to just highlight one thing you said and get you to talk a little bit more about it, because it has to do with the way that technology integrates with this. And you, you mentioned at the top that like emerging technology has always been part of this story and that that IoT has been like really critical. You mentioned this idea of a conditional, right? You move the you move the fragments, which are, you know, again, just to kind of make just to remind everyone, these are fragments of the interviews you did with your dad way back at the beginning of this process. Right. Like, so these are assets that have carried through all of these pieces. Um, when you say conditional there, what what does that mean that it that the audio is based on conditional? And talk a little bit about the technology as it works in the current piece, um, just to give people a sense of how like how the Internet of Things is related to this this piece of work. Sure. Well, one of the things that I wanted to do uh, was get away from the docent part. Um, so in this particular version, people uh, pick up a flashlight, they're given a flashlight and they have headphones. And then they kind of, uh, they go. It, it, as soon as it comes out of the charging station, it says, welcome to where there's smoke when they have it. Um, and we worked with a, a company called Elico, who uh, we kind of built a geo fence with their technology, right? Like, so we were able to, to create, excuse me, we were able to create an infinite number of zones. Normally, you know, you would attempt this with maybe like uh, beacons, but we were we were doing something that was more nuanced in the way like I could divide a room up and know when somebody was seated in a chair and then have somebody, you know, know where the, the threshold for a doorway was, know where like maybe six different things are happening in that room. Whereas if I had beacons, I couldn't do that. Right. Like, yeah. So like, so like a beacon technology would be like I would drop a beacon in a space and then anything that came into that space that the beacon that could communicate with the beacon would know it was in that space. Right. So you'd have to put beacons around the space and you'd be walking between dead zones between beacons and you wouldn't really know where things were in beacons because there's a there's limited information about how much you can get. But the geofence actually gives you the ability to track the object like tr in a triangulated way. So I actually know exactly where something is. And there are tests that you can see of what of what Peter and Jeff were producing where you could actually watch someone move with a phone and like see a line draw through the space in real time of like their motion. So, you know, like not just in a zonal sense, but almost in a, in a quite specific sense where they are. It's a, it's an amazing technology for that. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. Just wanted to give people a picture of that. Sure. Well, and, and to your point, you know, you're carrying a, a, a flashlight that has a microcontroller in it, right? And we built our own boards for it. So it's doing five layers of audio mixing in real time. It's a generative piece. So the score is generative. Everybody gets a different score. The order is different. Some people might not hear some of the stories that other people hear. It's a truly generative piece of work. Um, and to the conditional point that you asked me before, as I kind of move through, the device knows where I am in the space and it holds state. So it knows what I do. If I walk out, it'll pick me up when I come back in. Right. If I walk into certain parts, it knows what I've listened to. So we're collecting all kinds of amazing data. We have the pathways of where people go. Right. We have uh, the ability to uh, measure, you know, like what uh, or, you know, uh, gain data on what stories they've listened to, how long they've been in certain places. And the conditionals around that start to decay the score over time. So if you find yourself interacting with a table for a period of time, the score for you will start to decay. Right. Like, so it's really wild, kind of like how memories fade. So we're leaning into the potential aesthetics around the conditionals. And it was interesting with the conditionals, because once you start to do it, you have tremendous power. You could be like, oh, somebody walks in the room and all of a sudden all the lights flicker around and I could make all the flashlights go dim at once and have one come up. And you can do all kinds of control things with it. That's just insane. Right. Because you have a really fast read write time. It's pretty amazing that the technology, you know, that Josh found for it was uh, normally used in uh, tracking products in the factory. Right. And so it's it's taken from that and applied into an artistic context here. Um, and so uh, 
you know, there was a temptation to, to be really kind of like, like, oh my God, look at all the things that we could do. And I constantly was always like, no, we can't, we're not going to do that. It's really cool, but we're not going to do that. That's awesome. But it's like a moth to a flame. The moment that that happens, forget it. And so I kept pulling it back and restraining it and, and, and working. So it would drive the storytelling forward. But um, we're doing really interesting things with that data. You know, I'm doing a whole bunch of generative pieces where I'm making new artworks. I have a, a plotter, which is kind of like an arm that's controlled by a Raspberry Pi. And you put a pen in it, right? And it'll draw, right? Based upon whatever data you give. So um, that's in the front of the installation. When you come in, you see a drawing. And then you come to realize that like every line that it's drawn in these really cool images that later I'll lay down my dad's photographs and it'll actually draw with like uh, markers over top of them. And it's quite beautiful. Um, you come to realize that every line represents a person that's moved through and you can see the density of where people have been. And, and it's like a heat map almost of the space, but it actually tracks all their movement. So your interaction within the space is making new art, right? People are contributing on a regular basis. There's probably about 1500 objects that people have put into the into the exhibition based upon that visualization exercise that I mentioned. There's all kinds of other prompts that they do too. But what I'm interested in this is it's kind of a generative documentary. You know, it's like living, a living, breathing organism. It's that it, you know, I love this quote by uh, Godard, you know, he talks about a film having a beginning, middle and end, but not necessarily in that order. This piece has no end, you know, it's really wild and, and it's nonlinear. And, uh, you know, when people come out, you see that they start to realize that they didn't hear that or they didn't see that. And it takes on this really interesting quality that, that makes them think, start to think in different ways about, you know, perspective and what they had encountered within it. And it's resulted in really crazy engagement times. We average, I think, on average, uh, upwards of 30 minutes per person that goes through it, which is really wild because it doesn't have a set flow it isn't like some people might hear if they choose to explore they might only hear one story versus somebody might hear five right like so everybody's having different experiences um and uh there's been a lot of people who come back more than one time and it's worked really well for like 14 15 16 year old kids all the way up to you know folks who are retired and everything in between so it's been really wild to see that and i have like the data around it because we have time stamps of when people start, where they are within the experience. So the piece is really exploring that notion of kind of a generative system, you know, this idea of like, oh, hey, what, what could we do with this data? It can be used to make more art. It can be used to help us inform the process. Uh, but most importantly, it can, be infor it can be utilized to deliver a very emotionally resonant storytelling experience. Yeah, so we're we're kind of right at the end of this. So can you uh, can you tell people where they can see it and and what's next for the piece? Sure, um, you can see it. It runs all the way until October first at Art Yard. Uh, you can find Art Yard at artyard.org, uh, and uh, it's free. Uh, you just need to kind of book a ticket for it. It's about an hour and fifteen minutes from uh, New York and about fifty minutes, sixty minutes from Philadelphia. Uh, and then after this, it will be touring. So I'm in conversations with a number of different institutions in different parts of the world about staging it uh, in 2024 and beyond. Uh, and I'm working on um, some iterations that I'll continue to do. But I think just in closing, the thing that's really powerful to me about this work is uh, it's been really fascinating to, to be able to explore it, to let it grow over time to, to let it iterate. I think often there's so much about like, okay, I, I need to get this thing done and then I'm going to move to what's next. And people, you don't give yourself enough time to go through the drafts. I would argue that most scripts are underwritten, you know, most projects are underdeveloped. So there's, if you're able to have a working method that allows you to take the time and if you're patient enough, it can start to yield all kinds of powerful things that I will carry on long beyond this project, you know, and it's this project gave me a sense of continuity to really understand what I was learning in the design process because I, I was able to live with it and see it. It's like, if I write a script, I might overwrite certain things 
and I'll try to come back to it and I'll try to gain distance from it. And it's really hard. But if I put it in a drawer and step away from it for like a year and come back to it, it's all very clear. It's like I was overwriting that. That character doesn't belong there. This this is shit, you know, and it's very obvious. But how do you give yourself distance from something, you know, or, you know, what is that process like? So I have all kinds of uh, really valuable kind of learnings and failures from this project that I feel just very fortunate to have been able to experience because I allowed it to, to just grow. Uh, and I am fortunate to have had uh, about 50 so minutes to talk to you about it. And of course, to, to collaborate with you on this and other things. So uh, Lance, thank you so much for, for being here, for talking about it and for share, you know, for making and sharing this, this piece with us and, and for being so open uh, about what the process was and what you learned from it. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, no pro. Yeah. And thank you, no pro for, for this chance to talk about it. Uh, this again is Nick Fortino with Lance Weiler. Thank you for your, for listening and uh, check out where the smoke up until October 1st at Art Yard and pay attention to the Columbia digital storytelling lab for more of Lance's work in a variety of fields. <laughs>